Each week, we welcome to our NFG stage one of our highly talented members or special guests to bring you something designed to help you and your business. Our next guest is a well-traveled, inspirational individual with a passion for making a difference. In the last 15 years alone, she's become the first woman to lead a national Muslim organization in the UK, got a doctorate at Aberdeen University in multiculturalism, and began a series of movements focused on highlighting and enforcing a range of critical issues from climate change to period poverty. Most recently, she has been attaining prominence through her award-winning social enterprise, Wellness, that produces and sells natural toiletries and is responsible for donating over six and a half million to date to homeless and refugee women, food banks and schools as part of their period poverty campaign. The current focus is a 36 hour online event called Red Rebel Day, a campaign to raise £100,000 to supply 12,000 women with six months of supplies of menstrual pads to women in crisis. This month, our special guest has even done her first TEDx talk on the subject and soon hopes to release her first book entitled The Gift. I bring to you Dr. Zareen Ahmed. Good morning, Zareen. Good morning, good morning. Wow, oh my gosh, that, I think that was the best introduction I've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> I'm absolutely blown away by that. Thank you so much. Gosh, I'm a little bit overwhelmed by that, Richard. <laughs> um, but thank you, gosh, thank you so much for um, such a lovely welcome. And it was really lovely to meet some of you in the um, in the breakout room. And, uh, and yeah, it's been um, it's been quite a journey over the last few years. Um, uh, for those of you who weren't in the breakout room, I'm uh, as Richard says, it's actually a gift wellness, not JS wellness. I don't know where that came from, but um, I'm the founder and CEO of Gift Wellness, and uh, which is a social enterprise. Um, for every pack of menstrual products we sell, we have other toiletries as well, all plastic free, um, eco friendly, vegan and so on. Um, but for every pack of menstrual products we sell, we donate pads to women in crisis, so homeless women, refugees, food banks, um, schools in poor parts of the world. And, um, and currently our main focus is uh, an event called Red Rebel Day. Um, you'll see Neil and my colleague wearing a, a feather and I've got mine as well, but I just haven't figured out where to put it. <laughs> like, <laughs> do I put it in my skull, do I? Anyway, so um, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a background. Um, I was born in the West Midlands and brought up there and, uh, and I currently live in Derby. And, uh, but spent most of my working life in London. Um, I've, I've held various roles in the public and charity sector, but I hadn't done business before I did gift wellness. Um, and, and so what happened was that um, basically, this is a mother and daughter story. Um, I, I believe that there's a special magical connection between mothers and daughters. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, but uh, basically my daughter Halima, she was passionate about charity work. And whenever there was some kind of disaster in the world, the next day she would be baking cupcakes to sell at school and uh, to raise money for the cause. And she subscribed to UNICEF and all, was really passionate about doing charity work. And, and we had a pact together, Halima and I, that after she would finish university, um, that we would work together and have our own ethical business and our own charity. And these are the things that would get us really excited. Now, when Halima was 13, I went to Pakistan with my dad to visit my sick aunt. And while I was there, I made this plan with my cousin in Karachi that we'd establish a charity in the form of a school for local orphans in an empty property he had. And when we got back from Pakistan, I told Halima, she got really excited and she said, oh, you have to name that after me, mom. You have, my name has to be associated with it because you know that's what I want to do when I grow up. 
So we opened a bank account together called the Halima Trust at that time. And then six years later, Halima now 19, she secured her place to, to do um, international relations and global politics and to specialize in third world development at Nottingham Trent University. And um, it was just six weeks into her course when she was um, abducted in our hometown of Derby and murdered. Um, now, like any parent, if I ever heard of a trage tragedy concerning someone's child, I would think that it, it would kill me, you know? Um, but it turned out that this test that I didn't think was survivable actually ended up giving me such resilience, clarity, it made me fearless, maybe because after facing your worst fear, what else can scare you, right? But, um, but it was more than that. Uh, you know, it actually um, stripped away all the peripheral stuff that we do that isn't going to make an impact. And I was left with that promise and that that concept of, of doing Halima's work. Um, within a few weeks, we'd registered a charity in Halima's name. Remember that account that we opened six years before, the Halima Trust? And three years later, we'd built a school for orphaned and needy girls in Pakistan, 400, over 400 girls. We now have college there as well. So we have 850 girls there all together at the moment. But it was on my way back from Pakistan in 2011 uh, in April 2011, I was sitting in the airport lounge thinking, you know, I hadn't worked for over three years and I knew that I'd never work for anyone again. Um, I needed to work for myself and I knew that whatever I did, it needed to connect with this work, with the charity. And sitting there in that lounge, I picked up a magazine uh, and, and it opened onto this article about women in the Zatari Syrian refugee camp who were forced to tear strips off their clothing to fold up into makeshift sanitary pads and all the other horrific things they, they had to suffer in the refugee camp because they were women and how their kind of womanhood was sort of used against them like a weapon of war. And at that moment, I saw myself giving pads to these women and that was the start of the Gift Wellness Social Enterprise. I embarked on 18 months of research and development. I developed my own range of menstrual products and a business strategy whereby for every pack of, of products I sold, we donate pads to homeless and refugee women, food banks, schoolgirls, and so on. Um, my first container of stock arrived in January 2013. And the first thing I did before I, I sold a single pack was to call up a local charity were filling a container to take to that same Syrian refugee camp and, um, and, and, and got them to come and pick up uh, a, 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 pa a few pallets of stock after a bit of an argument, because at first he said, oh, oh but you know, we're, 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 we're filling this container with really important things like food and clothing and medicines. And I actually had to persuade him by kind of emotionally blackmailing him a bit and, and trying to imagine, asking him to try and imagine if his mother, his daughter, his sister were homeless, you know, or displaced in this way. And, um, and so I ran my business like this for a few years. And then in 2018, it was around the time of those, um, all of those women's right campaigns women's rights campaigns like Me Too, you know, the hashtag Me Too campaign. And there was that report by Plan International about, um, uh, you know, the period poverty in schools in the UK. And I started to get approached by customers and friends who wanted to get involved in this period poverty work, as they now called it. I, I, I didn't call it that before, that phrase was coined around that time. And that was the start of the Gift Wellness Foundation, the, which is periodpoverty.uk, um, our website. And, um, and so I, you know, and that was so that we could really establish a charity 
a registered charity with the sole purpose of eliminating period poverty. So this was my work for you know seven or eight years, and during that time we donated over six million menstrual pads. And then last year things took a different turn, and it was during the first lockdown. Um, like everyone else, I got the opportunity to to stop and think about my work and its impact. And I realized that, you know, we were missing something. I felt that, you know, we weren't addressing the root cause of period poverty. Yes, you know, this work had been healing for me, having, you know, donated millions of pads continuously for seven or eight years. But how come things were not changing? How come the problem seemed to be getting worse, if anything, especially during the pandemic? So I started to kind of peel the layers off this issue. And I realized that in an age when we can, like everything's on the table at the moment, we can talk about anything. Um, you know, I, I thought, you know, this is like the last taboo, the last stigma, the last form of discrimination that's so viscerally rooted in our patriarchal cultural DNA that even we women don't talk about it. We won't admit to it. Um, women didn't embrace how special and important our reproductive system was and try and normalize the conversation then why should anyone else why should men how could we demand equal rights when we feel still felt the need to hide the fact that we menstruated and the more layers I peeled off this subject the more convinced I was that the, the rights for women to have free access to menstrual products and to be respected for the fact that they carried the responsibility of the reproductive process for all humanity <laughs> was one of the most important human rights issues of our time. And I realized that, you know, virtually every systemic institution, be it a school or a workplace or the, the army, you know, it was originally built around the natural functionality of men. And so I thought, but what if, rather than women having to fit into a system that's designed for men, the working structure could be synchronized around the natural cycles of women's bodies. And, and, and it's not like it can't happen. I mean, during the pandemic, if nothing else, we've proven that we can work from home at, on, on days you know so if women are suffering with their menstrual cramps or, or menopause or other reproductive issues why can't they work from home and so these are the things that i started to ex explore and and i thought right you know this is the kind of thinking that we need to inject into the bloodstream of every organization thus allowing women to be well women <laughs> and and, um, and believe it or not, I've had my whole, yes, it is a stigma, but I've had my whole family, uh, yes, a, a traditional Muslim family, complete with long bearded uncles and teenage nephews and nieces and, and aunties in headscarves in my warehouse, packing and labeling menstrual products to send off for charity. So if it can happen in my community, in my family, it can happen anywhere. And, you know, I, I've really sort of questioned myself about this, uh, you know, with three sisters, why I was talking about periods so hush hush while I was growing up. And when I was at school, if a boy in my class had, said he had a pain in his stomach, he'd be sent home to rest. But if I was in extreme pain and blood loss, the school nurse would throw me a couple of paracetamol and say, it's fine, it's just your time of the month. And I remembered being at work and the women here will relate to this and actually having really bad cramps that day and really not feeling well and actually lying to my boss about why I couldn't deliver a certain presentation that day and then walking away thinking, you know, why did I have to lie about that? And why are women, homeless women, still having to tear strips off their clothes to fold up into menstrual pads? Isn't it the basic human right of every woman to menstruate without being ridiculed or bullied or undermined? I think that we live in an age where every diversity of individual is trying to carve out the kind of future that 
they want to live in that fits in with their natural composition. Um, so now is the time for women to break through this taboo and create the kind of world that they want to live in. And I think it's time for us in across every sector to embrace the menstrual cycle and go with the flow at home, at school, at work. And, you know, with that respect and understanding of the hormonal changes and the, the, the kind of stages that our bodies go through and the knowledge that this apparent weakness is one of the most miraculous things in the universe. So I hope that my story has sort of conveyed the synonymous relationship between hardship and periods. Both involve pain and difficulty, loss, recovery and renewal. For me, it goes full circle all the way back to that sort of idea of passing on the, you know, this sacred trust to our daughters you know, for them to feel empowered, fueled by our love to the next generation. Although in my case, it's not just through my own daughter, but through thousands of daughters who are benefiting from this work. Thank you. Oh, and as I finish, uh, I would like to um, just plug our event, otherwise knee will kill me. Um, it's the Red Rebel Day. This is our event that where we are trying to raise a hundred thousand pounds. We're currently at about 11 or 12% of the target. We're trying to raise a hundred thousand pounds to supply 12,000 women with six months supply of menstrual pads. And these are women who are nurses, who are teachers, who have lost their jobs, um, women who have lost their jobs in this country and are depending on food banks. Our biggest demand right now is from food banks and also women's shelters because the increase, because of the increase of women who have been abused and have been treated in a violent way um, during the lockdown. And, um, and so we're, we're just inundated, we're overwhelmed at the moment with the demand for menstrual products for, from homeless charities, food banks, and shelters and youth hostels and places like that. So um, please do, um, we'll put the link in the chat and, um, and we will, uh, you know, we hope that you can, you can support us. It's charityextra.com forward slash period poverty um, and I'm going to put that in the link right now. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>